welcome. Uh, happy Passover, happy Easter, happy Ramadan. Uh, I think I haven't left anything out. So, if you look at the world of politics, journalism, entertainment, sports, whatever, there are one-hit wonders, and there are flashes in the pan, and then there are long-distance runners. I think there's no doubt which of these categories Leslie Stahl fits. Uh, she has been at CBS for half a century. She has covered stories from Watergate to Iraq to Trump and beyond. Um, she was the first woman White House correspondent, I mean, fully accredited White House correspondent. And for the last three decades, she's been a mainstay of the most successful, most watched, and I think most profitable news show in the history of journalism. Um, she's in a perfect position to talk about the vast changes in the news business and the political world, uh, the challenges posed by the rise of social media, maybe even artificial intelligence. She's also found herself in the last week in the, in the crosshairs of media attention after her interview with Marjorie Taylor Greene, which we will be talking about, but not to the exclusion of the other issues, just to be clear. Because um, th that incident and beyond also raises questions about what approach journalism can take when examining public figures whose comments cross the line between truth and falsity and outright conspiracy theories. Taken as a whole, these questions suggest that journalism is facing some of the biggest challenges ever. And I can't think of anyone I'd rather hear talking about them than our guest tonight, Leslie Stahl. I want to just stipulate right off the top that I don't like to be interviewed. I want to interview you. I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. It's a comfortable position to be and, in. And good luck with that tonight. <laughs> well, uh, in fact, we owe Leslie Stahl a debt of gratitude because indeed she's not the only journalist who don't like to be interviewed. And this situation is such that she could just as easily say, you know, I can't talk about this and so book somebody else. Well, wait, you asked me months ago. Yeah. And but I wouldn't stiff you. You could have faked this. You could have had an injury. I mean. Ooh, I it, hadn't thought of you know, that. It's, it's what the NBA players do in the season when they want to tank to get anyway. You're next, here. Next time. You're here. And so, uh, you know, right off I the bat. I want to thank everyone for coming let's, out on Easter. And Passover. And Passover. And Ramadan. And Ramadan. And Ramadan. Thank you. OK. So let's, let's deal with the elephant in the room so we can move on. And the first question that I think a lot of people have raised, and I think this is actually, the, in my view, the easier one is, why book her at all? Why do this profile of somebody with these strange views? Uh, what? Uh, I, we wanted to interview her because she's become powerful. She's the reason that uh, Speaker McCarthy is Speaker. Uh, I think that she has him in a place where he has to listen to her. Um, she really represents the MAGA constituency in the House of Representatives. So we saw someone who rose to um, extraordinary national power in less than two years. And we found that uh, powerful people get to be cross-examined on 60 Minutes. It's also reasonable to say that there are all kinds of people that you have that the show has dealt with in the past where people raise the same question, right? Oh, indeed. Like? Uh, well, my first interview this season was the president of Iran, Raisi, and uh, we had Saddam Hussein, Noriega, Putin, uh, during going way back. So this is really the DNA of 60 Minutes. Going back, Mike Wallace did how many controversial people, including the Ayatollah Khomeini, which was a very famous interview, but Haldeman Ehrlichman during um, during Watergate. So it's who we are, it's what we do, and this is in the tradition. Um, and it's, it's distressing that people don't want to hear what, polit what a powerful politician has to say. OK. So that, that takes that, us past that first question. Oh, that was the first question? That was three questions. <laughs> 
But you also know probably better than almost anybody that there are landmines about an interview like this. If you're too tough, then her friends will say, well, that's just liberal media. We didn't expect anything else. You're just a bunch of lefties. If you're too easy, it's, oh, you gave her a pass. Uh, you rolled over. And so take us behind the scenes, if you will, as you're putting together this profile, and it's a profile, um, how, are you, how are you adjusting the focus? Do you want to show us Marjorie Taylor Greene, the person? Do you want to spend a lot of time on some of her more controversial <clears throat> views? Mm -hmm. How do you, when you sit down and say, what are we going to do about this? How much are we going to devote to which part of her? Well, these kinds of form, uh, profiles, you're right to call it that, that we do are almost formulaic in that we almost always go home with whoever it is. We show the audience how they grew up um, and ask them questions about their childhood. We almost all do, do it, whoever we're, we've got in this position, if they'll let us come, go home mm -hmm. with them. And uh, we always do, almost always, uh, two interviews, one about their personal life and then a second one about the issues. So it, it followed sort of the script in that, in that sense. And, and the, the pushback on this, and it's not just about this interview, although, is, well, what you're doing, the argument goes, is you're normalizing it. Here is somebody uh, who has uh, offered a whole variety of views, some of which, or many of which you, t you touched on, some of which I assume for time you couldn't. You know, you say, okay, so this is somebody who says that Hillary Clinton uh, killed John Kennedy Jr., that Nancy, Nancy Pelosi should be executed for treason. How do you say, all right, that's part of her, but so is the part that goes to the gym that has a huge following? Where do you, how do you make that calculation? Well, as with any piece that we do on 60 Minutes, we do very extensive interviews, usually run between two and three minutes, three hours, two and three hours. <laughs> and, uh, and I did two with her. Uh, this is normal. We shoot a lot of footage, and we bring it back, and we make our editorial decisions in the basically in the office and the edit room before computer. We have transcripts made of every single thing I say and they say, and then we make our editorial decisions. the The interview is designed to be comprehensive, where we would touch on as many controversial issues as we could get in within the two to three hour time span. So, so you at some point went <clears throat> down the list of all the things she said and said, this is what we're gonna ask her about. We don't have room for this. Or we, we're gonna- Yeah, for the most part. Triage. For the most part. So here's <clears throat> the almost last question about this. And it comes from somebody who made one of the more telling observations about how journalism works and the name of that person is Leslie Stahl. And it's a story you have told many times, including here. It's what happened in 2004 when you did a piece, I assume for the Evening News, contrasting the airy, optimistic Reagan commercials with what you regarded as facts that were left out. And you discovered that the Reagan people In loved 1984. Oh, four, yeah. Oh. Morning in America. 84. 84, sorry. Yeah, 1984. No, 04 wouldn't have been very inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it so, was right before his re-election. Okay, and, you, and, and what did they tell you? They told you? They told me, well, can I go back? Yeah. Uh, I did an evening news piece on the Reagan re-election campaign that was pretty tough. And uh, I was covering the White House at the time, quite sure they'd never answer any phone call of mine ever again. The piece was hard hitting and they loved it. And I couldn't understand how could they love it. They thanked me, it was on the eve of the election. And they said, well you and television haven't figured it out. When the picture is powerful enough that people are, get an emotional reaction to it, they don't even hear what you're saying. You are drowned out right. by what's coming in through the optic nerve and goes somewhere behind there down into the gut where people make <clears throat> judgments and decisions about people. 
And we proved that that was true. We brought the piece to a focus group. And but isn't, most of them didn't hear what I said at all. But, and the rest of them thought it was a positive news story. So why doesn't that apply to the Mary T Marjorie Taylor Greene story? The one person, you know, I'm, I'm not quoting these critics because you know them. That's fine. But, but one person who loved this piece was Steve Bannon. Sure. Why not? Well, but that... <laughs> you know, I can't help who loves our piece. We were... What, what I was going to say about the picture, and it had very little to do with the actual piece itself, mm -hmm. was how it was advertised and pro promoted. Because unlike most of our stories, for some reason they didn't put out ahead of time a back and forth. They put out pictures of her and me walking around. A lot of the criticism came before the piece ever aired. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she's collecting questions. I didn't know what's going on. So uh, you're. So wait. So so the so before we ever got on the air, and a and a person, a friend of mine, brought this up to me. My daughter. <laughs> that before anything, people saw pictures of her and me walking. We do the famous sixty minutes walk, and we walked in front of her house, and we walked in the Capitol, and we were conversing. And there was no Q and A going on in the in the teaser that ran Thursday night, Friday night, and so forth on television. And people got an impression, because they were pictures, that this was friendly because we were talking. And it set it set the whole stage for this. We do so many interviews with people that m a majority of Americans would not want us to put on our air. We do. We do them once a month, let's say. We never got a reaction like this. Why did this happen? And it started before a single question was shown to the public. And so I point to that story that you're telling and say, yeah, people saw the picture. They made their initial judgment. It was powerful. And it colored the way people saw the interview. OK. Um, I'm my answer. I, I, I am reminded of, because people in your business and what still semi is my business, face this all the time. How do you approach, um, when I went to South Africa, I was assigned by Nightland to tell the story of the Afrikaners, mm -hmm. the white oh, supremacists. Yeah. Did those two. Uh, and you know, that wasn't exactly my view of things, but that was the job. So I'm remembering one guy who I thought figured this out when Tim Russert, the late Tim Russert, mm. had David Duke on, former Nazi, former Klansman, he, had, he was in the runoff for governor of Louisiana. The very first question that Tim asked him was, what was it about growing up in America in the 1960s that made you become a Nazi? Now that set a tone in a sense that, you know. It did. But it, it, this whole issue uh, raises, I think, a broader question. Which he wasn't the, powerful, let's point that out. Say again? David Duke yeah. was not a member of Congress. No, but he was the Republican one. candidate for governor of Louisiana. He just won a primary. Yeah. That's when but, his opponent, Edwin Edwards, ran the slogan, vote for the crook, it's important. <laughs> so he was in a position to have a, a, a fair amount of power. But my question is, and I do think this is the age of Trump, we all grew up in a particular way of how you approach interviews, pieces. You know, when I went out and covered Jesse Helms, it was not my job to say, this is the last racist in the United States Senate. You know, you want maybe the facts to be. But when you have a candidate or a figure like Donald Trump, the press was caught in a bit of a vise at first. And by the end even of the 16 campaign, the New York Times was, was calling him in headlines a liar. Yeah. So how does that, you know, how does that world and the MAGA world, which uh, I'm perfectly prepared to say it, you know. But are you suggesting we don't put anybody no, on from that quite side? Quite the contrary. What the we? question is the context. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, one of the people who proved that, it seems to me, was you when you were interviewing Donald Trump the last time. You, you, know, you pushed him to the point where he, I think, pretty much walked out of the interview, right? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I so, pushed her, too, and she got angry, as you saw. Well, 
I do want to move on from, from good. you know, um, people will make their own judgment about how that piece worked, but there's a, a bigger issue here. I pushed her pretty hard, and she, when we edit, we don't show the whole interview, we don't show the six times I would go back. She got angry, not because of what you saw me ask her, uh, the two, two or three questions before, but because we've been going at it for an hour. Mm. And that, that isn't the way we do our profiles. We don't just show you one aspect of but it. We but show take, you the whole person. But take us, to the, take us purpose. to the broader question. When you were dealing with a, a political figure who, uh, who flatly says uh, one and one is five, yeah. and not only that, but the people who say one and one or two are traitors, um, they're communists, uh, they're pedophiles, which you raised, they're satanic child killers, and they, and, you know, and they should be executed for treason. All of which she has at one point or another said, yeah. and she's hardly the only one. How, how did, I've seen a whole lot in the last few years of journalists and journalism critics trying to wrestle with how you do this. You can't just say, Marjorie Taylor Greene says A, uh, but the facts show B, or there are two sides to the story, because sometimes there aren't two sides to it. Exactly. How do you deal with that? Well, one, we will not put on the air anything that's a lie that either we do not challenge within the interview or we challenge after they say it. So 60 Minutes is not going to put something on that's not true, and we will point out that it isn't true one way or another. Sometimes you prepare yourself for these kinds of interviews, and you think you know everything, and you don't, and you don't catch all the lies. But we, as we said, I said in the interview, we fact check, and nothing gets into our pieces that isn't true. Now, she did say that <laughs> President Biden was a pedophile, and she said it, and I remember saying to her, well, you know, that isn't true. And, she said, I said, you know that isn't true. And then I said, why would you say that? And then I just rolled my eyes. Because what are you going to say? What am I going to come on and say for a third time, he's not a pedophile? Please. You know, if, if, if she had said to you, for instance, in an interview, um, Donald Trump is just like Nelson Mandela and Jesus Christ, which she said. Mm -hmm. Not to me, but she did say that. So what is your follow-up? Are you going to say, no, he's not? You're just going to look into the camera and say, oh, my God, there's, you know. What are you going to say? What's the follow-up to that? There's no follow-up. Trust me, actually, there's no actually, appropriate follow-up. Uh, okay. And as someone said, and I love this, this is my favorite of all the banging on my head that I took, a couple of people were kind and said, just putting her on the air was the gotcha. Well, that, and that, see, that... that that leads to the broader question that we actually were talking about a while ago. Um, by the way, if, if I had had the honor of being in an interview and she said that, I would have said, you know, I don't know. My temptation would have been to say, you know, that's sort of the same level of your argument that the California wildfires were started by a space laser run by the Rothschilds, which unfortunately I was kind of waiting for that to show up in the piece. There just been, that's yeah. kind of the same... But that's me, because I have, I have no tact, and I don't have that platform. <laughs> um, but well, we thought that by having me come back on the pedophile thing twice and then just roll my eyes. That was... Well, we, when I say we, it's a committee, not mm -hmm. just me. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not unhappy with the interview, for the record. Go ahead. Okay. So let's go, let's go to this issue of how you... Of how as a general proposition, um, journalism has been struggling with this at least since the days of Joe McCarthy, when they learned that it was not enough to say McCarthy says there are 200 communists in the State Department, Dean Acheson says there aren't. That ain't going to do it. At some point, you have to weigh in and say, and the facts are, mm -hmm. you know, there are no, or there are two, Alger Hiss and one other, and that's it. And, and Biden's not a pedophile. Yeah. And so... At what point, in doing that, do journalists also have to be careful that there's a limit to that? I mean, you know, because at some point that becomes almost like a campaign ad against the person you're interviewing, even if what you're doing is telling the truth. Right. Yeah. 
Well, these are all questions that you struggle with when you bring all your material home and put it together. And knowing that the 60 Minutes audience uh, is a pretty sophisticated group of people. And uh, I don't think, to be, to be frank, now we, I don't know myself how many people watch 60 Minutes online or on, in snippets uh, and, and where they're seeing it or, because they all, the Nielsen is only what we show at 7 o'clock at night. Um, but we're, our audience didn't balloon because she was on. No, in fact, it, it, it was a bit down. It was, well, because we didn't have a sports lead-in. Oh. It was you, what we normally would get without a sports lead-in. Okay. So we didn't have basketball or football. Uh, it was kind of pretty much normal for this time of year. So she didn't, it, you know, the, the audience didn't explode with people dying to see what she had to say. I suspect we had our usual audience, not just in numbers, but who generally watches. I, I, I was wondering why she did it. I've explained why we wanted her on. She's powerful. Why did she want to come on 60 Minutes? What was she hoping to do? And I was confused. I thought, what I think a lot of my critics thought, that she wanted to come on and normalize herself and appeal to a wider audience of people. Um, but from, from the beginning of the second interview, where she started pounding away, saying things that were outrageous, um, I thought, nope, that's not where she's going. <laughs> and I... <laughs> well, she may have that old, there's no such thing as bad publicity, although that... May... Well, my daughter, who's very smart, <laughs> said she thought, and of course this is pure speculation, but she thought that in Marjorie Taylor Greene's mind, there was an audience of one, and that was Donald Trump, and this was her audition to run for vice president. Mm. Ha! Everybody agrees with you. Makes there we go. Sense. <laughs> there's, there's something Pretty else smart. At, at work here. Uh, I don't know that you and I disagree about the degree to which politics has become polarized, that people live in silos, and that they are... No, no, that's not... What I disagree okay. let me just, with... Let me, okay. I, I don't disagree with what okay. you're saying. Okay. I disagree about how movable it yeah. is. Yeah, well, that's where we're going to get to okay. next. But the point about, about the polarization is I believe that one of the great beliefs about journalism in itself is under real challenge. And the great belief is if we go out and tell the people what is, they will rally... It's, it's, you know, all the newspaper movies where the heroic reporter breaks the milk trust or the bank trust or Edward Arnold and the cigar-smoking Nazis, and the people say, yes, by God, we understand. Watergate. And, right. Okay. And in fact, in Watergate, it happened. Exactly. And produced a generation of journalism students who might have been better off doing something else, but that's another story. <laughs> right. But now, that's not what we're seeing. What we're seeing now is, you, you know, you can come out after January 6th in particular and say, for heaven's sakes, the outgoing president of the United States, I will say this, you don't have to, attempted to overthrow the government, attempted to stage a coup, and was perfectly prepared to have the military seize the ballot boxes. That's pretty out there. And his people, or the people, did not say, we got this guy wrong. Oh, for heaven, I thought he was a hero. No, he, you know, this is unacceptable. And so the question is whether or not, to a significant extent, that notion, why do we do this? You know, you're, you're pushing the same buttons. I don't mean you personally, but, you know, and, and it's not happening that way. Well, you forget, uh, and I don't because I covered Watergate, that the American people were with Nixon almost up to the end. They stuck with him and stuck with him no matter what was coming out in the Washington Post or in those Senate hearings, for those of you I can tell by the color of your hair that you watch, uh, were watching in the afternoons. The American people stuck with him, stuck with him, stuck with him, all through years. And then it began to deteriorate. And it, be it was a long time coming. And I saw a poll today, and this is why I was disagreeing with you. We had dinner together. Um, there's a poll ABC did yesterday, I guess. And what's happened is his support 
Trump support among independents has completely collapsed. He is now down to approval rating of 25%. That's as low as he's ever gotten. I'm not saying that this man isn't going to pull another Houdini act on us, because how many times have we said he cannot survive attacking John McCain? He cannot, uh, you know, all the things we thought, well, this is the end. But there are people who can be, there, whose minds have been changed by the indictment, just the indictment. So, you know, I'm saying the, the let's say, call it the jury is out. Well, as, um, as no journalist ever said, only time will tell. <laughs> right. But I, my skepticism um, may be confined to the, to the base, but... Well, the um, base ain't moving. I'll well, no, that. okay. So, because one of the things that you indeed asked Congresswoman Green is, uh, you, um, you're for a federal ban on abortion. 80% of the Republican caucuses are federal ban on abortion. Even after the election results seem to be telling the Republicans, this isn't helping you. Uh, she thinks the election was stolen. Two thirds of the Republicans in the House and at least that percentage of people who are, believe the election was stolen. Mm -hmm. So w what I think, I think you're illustrating is that at least among the people who are gonna decide, let's say the nomination. Oh, absolutely. The nomination. You know, the, there we'll is get a the nomination. It's, none of this stuff seems to have. But that's now down to 25%. Okay. Used to be 40, not that long ago. Well, I'm, I'm curious to see. You may well be right about that. I, I just don't know. Right. But I do know that, that the, one of the things that happened slowly over time, and particularly after the tapes with Watergate, um, you might remember the number, on the House Judiciary Committee, at least six Republicans voted to impeach the president. Yes. Right. Um, and you now have... But you know, all the rest didn't, and there were like 17 who voted not to indict with all the evidence that had come out, and it's... Yeah, I think, I'm trying to remember the numbers, but it was a, it, let's put it this way. Compared many to, more voted to support him than went the other way. Um, that, that in this case, uh, after January 6th, the high watermark of discontent among establishment Republicans were the eight senators who voted to convict on the second impeachment. Mm. And uh, how many of them are left? I, I would guess none. No, I think, there, I think uh, Cassidy. Oh, two? Yeah, uh, some were tired and some, yeah. And of the, of the House Republicans that voted for impeachment, I think there may be one left, which means that within that party, they're doubling down. Within, within the Republican Party. I, what The collapse came among independents, yes. Okay. I, I want to... I, I keep wondering how much the Republican Party, that is people who identify themselves, tell pollsters I'm a Republican, how much those numbers have come down. I keep asking our pollster and I never there, get a really... You mean the change answer. in party identification? Yeah, no, the numbers. Yeah. I, and that would be significant. I don't know. But... It, Okay, let's change the subject. Yeah, I want to. I, I want to talk for a second about the uh, the defamation suit against Fox. By oh, the okay. Yeah. Easy, easier, huh? Well, uh, let's see. But but it, here but here's the, here's the core of it for me, because I don't think this particular aspect is confined to Fox. What we have learned in all the uh, the, the discovery hmm. is that within the Fox world, they felt that if they told what they understood to be the truth about the election, they would lose viewers. But that seemed to be the case. Yeah. I mean, that was, that, that's literally from Rupert Murdoch on down to Tucker Carlson where, where... But it was true. Okay. No, I'm asking. I'm not, I don't, What's it, true? It was true yes, yeah. that yeah. as they right. so called they, Arizona, they lost an So there seems to be a choice that they made. <laughs> Either we keep telling them what we think we know to be true and we, we hurt ourselves at the bottom line, or we, to use the phrase of one of the Fox executives, respect the audience. Yeah. Which is, I mean, that, that's euphemism with a capital E. <laughs> but here's my question. Is it confined, is it only Fox that is telling its viewers or readers what they want to hear? 
Or is it fair to say that on the other side of the, of the spectrum, you're not getting a lot of, of on it's MSNBC? It's a really good question. It's an excellent question. Um, it's not true of 60 Minutes. <laughs> I mean that. Uh, but an executive at CBS, you'll recall, when I don't know if he was asked or he volunteered about how much we were putting Trump on the air, on the air, said, he's not good for the country, but he's really good for ratings, so we're going to keep putting him on the air. That was your former CEO. Yes, it was my former CEO. No longer the CEO. No longer. But mm -hmm. So to answer your, I think your question is an excellent question. Nothing to the extent that Fox went, where they, they were riding the Trump horse so enthusiastically, and they hated him. I mean, that, that's quite extraordinary. And they call themselves a news division. But They're I'm talking balanced about, news division. I'm talking about something else, whether or not MSNBC mm -hmm. feels comfortable going, going uh, critical on Biden. Mm. Or whether they're going to, I mean, I think I told you when CNN had a group of lawyers on who said, you know, some, most of whom said, this indictment out of New York is looking a little, a little shaky to me. I'm not sure this is really good. And the response to a lot of their views was, ah, you're going after the Fox audience. You're becoming conservative. Not, well, that's your judgment about the case. That I think people... And, and people, they lost audience, you think? No, I just think that, I, I just think that there is a... You're saying, there's, you're saying that there are some news shows that pander. More, I think I'm saying something else, the that there audience. is a fear, and it may be justified, that if you tell your audience what it doesn't want to hear, they're, gonna, they're going to not accept it and say, well, maybe I was wrong about this. They're going to say, well, you know, they're going to challenge your motives. Uh, they're going to say you're swinging to the right, you're pandering to the... This is, this is so sadly symptomatic of where we are right now, where people only want to hear what they want to hear. They want to turn on television or open a newspaper, if you still do that, or whatever, and ha have your own thoughts propelled back to you, and if you, they don't get it, they will go somewhere else. And you're asking me if that means that the reporters and the anchor people feel Maybe. compelled to soften their own pull personal their punches. views, pull their punches. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but yeah. it's a scary question to ask and a legitimate question to ask and one we should all be worried about. And it comes to mind to me when the idea that 60 Minutes might put on something that our audience won't want to see um, is, is attacked. Yeah, but you're, you're, in a, you're in an incredibly great situation, which is that for more than 50 years, you've built an audience that is so devoted to the show that it will follow you. I was laughing I about this. You, you guys can do a show about a, a monastery in, in the Carpathian Mountains where they uh, grow lima beans and don't talk, and we'll watch it because we've come, you know, because first of all, it's probably good journalism. That was a great piece. <laughs> there was a piece pretty close to it. Very you, close you, to you'll it. You'll do classical musicians, really you'll close. do, you know, you'll do all these things that aren't supposed to work on TV yeah. because you, you have had, you know, that show's had 50 plus years to build that audience uh, at the, at one point protected by a time slot where- Still protected else, by Nobody the can slot. compete with you, which is cool. <laughs> um, but that's unique. I think it is, uh, and on top of all of this, I we're just talking got all those rotten questions written on down on that piece of paper. <laughs> is that a bad? That a rotten question? <laughs> no, really. <laughs> Giving no. you the business. Because I'm getting to, I'm, get, I'm te teeing up something that you have actually prepared. Because one of the other things that we're all dealing with is with the growth of. Uh, artificial intelligence with the technology to be able to do deep fakes. It used to be you had to spend, have a lot of money to do that. Now you can do it in your, in your parents' basement with you know, five bucks on a box top and you can make uh, Joe Biden uh, come out for, um, I don't know, ritual slaughter. And it'll look but real. But pedophilia. Yeah. <laughs> but, you, but you, in fact, have brought something I did. to illustrate this. this well, I this, did not know this. This was not This great. was, um, no. I haven't shown him this yet. This, this was to show you how scary AI is. Now, I know you all know how scary AI is because we all read that incredible New York Times story. But um, I went and did an interview with Microsoft 
because they introduced AI into their search engine, Bing, and I got to ask their AI to write me a poem that would be advice to their CEO about how to handle the 60 Minutes interview. Be honest, clear. This is from AI to the CEO. Be honest, clear, and concise. Don't evade, and don't tell them lies. lies. Show them you have nothing to hide, and back your claims with fact and pride. And that's just what he did. He followed this thing. Remember, they are not your foes. They're just doing what they chose to inform the public of the news and give them different points of views. But I saw this, and I, I thought he followed it. I thought he said, I can't lie. I have to come off as being open and not insulted by the questions and just sit there as though I'm, I'm just very proud of what we've done out of AI. OK. Yeah. OK. But I think that, I mean, that's a, that's a. Scary. That's, that's less scary than. Well, yeah. Than a lot of other things. Yes, but never mind nevertheless. The, never mind the generation of law school applicants Here, who I, have AI write their essay. I, I wanted to do, I wanted to start an organization. I can't because I'm in the media, but I wanted to start an organization called Organization of Grandmothers Against Social Media because I am so worried about social media in general. Now we have to add AI on top of it. And I was really thinking I would love to do that until I realized that Organization of Grandmothers Against Social Media spells orgasm. <laughs> And your and your and your problem is, <laughs> problem is I think you'd get a hell of an audience. But you know what? No, but I hate the whole thing. The yes, social but media. Oh. Understood. And it, you know, a hundred years ago, I don't know who said it. Maybe you remember that. Um, truth, a lie goes halfway around the world before truth gets its boots on, and that was before social media. <sighs> So I, I, to sometimes I picture traditional news media as, as in a rowboat with tin cans, oh. you know, while, while this flood of stuff comes pouring in quite literally by the second. And so what happens is you, you know, between that and deep fakes, you get a huge number of people who believe, um, to quote the Congresswoman, that uh, Hillary Clinton and some other Democrat ritually slaughter babies. Uh, I think she kind but of... But your, your larger point, it, yeah. it makes me despair. Yeah. Well, I okay. don't know how we thread. I don't even just mean media. I mean the whole country from where we are. I, I don't know how we thread our way out of this. I, I, I can't see it. I can't see a path. You know, in the past when countries got in this kind of trouble, they went to war and that would end it all or we'd get a new system of government. How I thought you were the optimist about people changing their minds and stuff. What this is, uh, this is not what I was expecting. I'm talking media here. Well, well, I'm talking the country. You're right. I'm talking the country being being fed information that isn't true, being asked to believe what isn't true. I was talking about Trump before. I think Trump is. No, but before, I mean, at dinner. Before I was talking about. You think Trump. people change? You can get people to change their minds on Trump. Okay. But I wonder how we thread out of the distrust we have for each other, how the polarization comes to an end, how pe you and I were talking at dinner about how you can't, in your own family, can't talk to someone if they're on the other side. I mean, the only way to keep the family together is not talk about issues. And how do we get ourselves out of this? And how does the media survive this? Well, the, <clears throat> not to be even more pessimistic, but oh, this at, is dark. But I mean, this is the season for Christians of renewal and hope. But this is the YMHA, so I'll be pessimistic. Um, <laughs> Very good. Uh, they didn't get it. You know, we, as you know, there are all of these organizations trying to Hebrew figure out. Pessimistic. How, you know, all right. We need a common set of facts. We need everybody should be able to agree on this. And the people who are pushing this idea, Pointer Institute, the Aspen Institute, I don't know, you know. Yeah. In my view, these are the people who least need to be doing this because they know that, and the people you most want in on this are not participating in this. Because among other things, it turns out you can build a certain degree of, of political strength, and certainly you can make a lot of money uh, peddling yeah. extreme. lies. Lies and extreme. Um, 
and you know that's a pretty uh, a pretty powerful incentive not to change. I mean, if you are, I mean, I, I, you know, if you are Tucker Carlson, um, on one hand you say I, I hate Trump, you know, he's terrible, and then have him on and prop him up. Well, yeah, that would be the polite way of saying it, but yeah, prop him up because that's what your audience is wanting. And you're, you know, you're, that's, you're right. making a, a, a ton of money with that. Um, so we're, all, we're talking about two different things, but they're both leading to a dark place. Well, that's, you know, I hope that's right. We have, if you've got questions, um, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Leslie, you don't know what the question is. <laughs> I'm guessing. Okay. Right, don't be optimistic. Did you send okay. one in that was nice and sweet? See, the, this is the, uh, the, the very first question I asked is, th is this question. You know, why put her on? But you've answered that question. Um, you said today, tonight, that the public stayed in support of Nixon nearly until the end of his presidency. What was the tipping point? And Smoking gun. Sorry? Smoking gun. I thought it was the firing of Archibald Cox. Oh, no, it was way after that. Really? Oh, yeah, okay. way after that. This was, uh, you know, the, the, the real tip came, came after the impeachment hearings and really was associated with the smoking gun, which was real fast. You mean when the tapes finally came out, yeah. the last tape? That was yeah. three days before he resigned. Yeah. You think it, it was it, that late that it, the public switched? Pretty much. Okay, we can, do you think it's possible today for public opinion, what, if it's possible to tip today, what would it be? I think this may be a Trump-related question because it's a little hard to imagine what could come out about him that would change his supporters. So you wrote a column recently in the Washington Post about how people who are indicted or go to jail get reelected. Yeah. Frequently, if not always, it whatever. Yeah. It and uh, I, I saw this ABC poll about how his numbers have collapsed because he was indicted. And I wonder how, how all of that jibes in your mind. Because I think, okay, yeah. uh, you're interviewing me now, but I that's know. okay. <laughs> it's in your blood, Leslie. First, I think that um, for reasons that I'm gonna be writing about, I think, I think the odds, the, the chances of Trump getting the nomination remain very high. You know, he doesn't Among need Republican. 50%, uh, he's got that base. Um, there are other reasons that it, I don't want to take up the audience, but I think that is a, a possibility. Once you are the nominee of a major party, who last time, if you don't count the, if, if you count the real vote, not the popular vote, 44,000 votes in three states would have, would have made it a tie, and the way it works, 26 House delegations would have voted for Trump, he'd still be president. 44,000 votes out of 160 million. So all you have to imagine is any one of a dozen events. Is Biden still going to be running? If not, do we think the Democrats can avoid a, a civil war, uh, who the nominee is? Will the economy collapse? Um, there's a certain degree to which the public or a part of the public as they say on Wall Street has priced Trump's, it's priced it into the stock. They know they know what they know, and nothing seems to bother them. So that's why I think, you know, these numbers may hold up. You may well be right that, you know, the, I mean, there are Democrats right now who say, well, we can't wait for Trump to be the nominee. You know, and my feeling is, uh, you, can you think all the way back to 2016? Um, I remember in 1980, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but we had a bet on that election. I don't remember. I'm sure I lost. I always lost. It was a very nice dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but my point was, I understand why people back then were saying, Reagan, we got to have Reagan as the nominee Democrat. said, he's an actor. He's, nobody will buy into that. That's he only, true. That's he true. only won 44 states. So that's why. <laughs> right. It's not that I don't do predictions because, uh, you know, I wrote a book saying that John Lindsay could be the next president. I learned early. <laughs> don't do that. But that's why. It's just, it's not a, this is going to happen. I hate, I don't hate. I am not impressed by people who write, here's why X will happen. Yeah. We, we have learned, all of us in life, that's ridiculous. Exactly. Um, it's a good question uh, online. Are you able to choose or refuse your assignments? And if so, any regrets? Ah, 
Uh, the answer is yes, and our, it's part of our job to come up with our own stories. Um, I remember when Hewitt hired me and he told me that, I thought, I won't be able to come up with stories. Where am I going to find stories? I'd always been assigned before that. He said, you're going to find that you never run out of ideas. And I thought, oh boy, what's he telling me? I don't believe that for one minute, but it's true. You just we have so many stories we want to do that we haven't gotten to yet. I can't think right now on my feet of a story that I was assigned and I said no to, I wish I hadn't, or the other <coughs> way around. There are stories, I'm sure, if I went back through the catalog, that I proposed and they said no for whatever reason. And I'm still angry about it, I'm sure. <laughs> this is a, an allied question. And, and these, I like these questions because they, they're folks who like the news and want to know what's going on. What was the most difficult interview or assignment you've done? Or if you can't give one? Uh, no, no. What I, happened? I, I, I know. You know, I, for eight years in the 80s, I did Face the Nation, which is live. And when the clock is ticking and you've got about 28 minutes and the person is filibustering, and you want to strangle them, but you know you can't <laughs> be furious at someone or hit someone on the air. Um, the pressure that builds up in you to make sure you get all your questions asked, at least. Um, so this was an interview I did with Margaret Thatcher, live television. And it was during Iran-Contra. And she, as we know, was Ronald Reagan's best friend in, in, among all the leaders in the world. And she came over to the United States to support him during Iran-Contra. And I said, well, why are you supporting him? He lied to you. And she said, my dear, my dear. Ah, the relationship between the United States and Great Britain is solid. I asked the same question again. But he lied to you. I mean, you know, you say I don't follow up, I followed up. He lied to you. My dear, my relationship with Ronald Reagan <laughs> As any in the whole wide world, my dear. I asked her a third time. She snapped, totally snapped, on live television. She said, why is it, my dear, that I seem to love your country more than you do? That was the mo moment of my life where I thought, oh, please, please Bomb have scare. a whole Bomb scare. open. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, but the clock ticked and the show ended and I ran home and cried and whatever you do. I, I was on Bill Buckley's firing line as a then young inquisitor which shows Ellen, and she was the guest and I said to her, to what extent, she had just become leader of the conservative party, not the pre -end. I said, to what extent was the fact that you were a woman, you know, how did that oh, affect? I, and yeah. she oh. said, I, I'm not quoting this exactly, she said, do you mind if I tell you, that's an exceedingly stupid question. <laughs> And I lacked the wit at that age to say, do you mind if I tell you that that's an exceedingly ridiculous answer to a perfectly valid question? <laughs> I thought about that say, six months later. She used to say, she used to say, because she always got that question, and she hated it, she used to say, well, how would I know I've never been a man? If you say, you asked her, what's the difference? How would I know? She was pretty good at that, she doesn't was, she? Oh, um, smart. You may or may not want to answer this question, and it's not what you think it is. <laughs> What if I who, are your who are your top three most respected journalists that you've worked with or even just, just watched? Doesn't well, Mike. Mike Wallace, for sure. Um, boy. I'm going to stop at Mike and tell you an amazing story about Mike. So he's the reason that I went to 60 Minutes. He brought me there. So of course I adored him. So one day he calls me into his office and he said, Leslie, you're never going to make it until you learn to ask an embarrassing question without being embarrassed. Mm. I know. And I thought, well, I'm never going to get there. <laughs> if it's embarrassing, it's going to show because I'm embarrassed. And he said, you have to work on it. He said, I can do it. <laughs> and he said, Barbara can do it. And you've got to get yourself there. And the f it's not a funny thing, but your respect for him, oh. I understand that survived some of the things we've heard about his behavior, oh which in a Me Too age would well, not have been. He, was, he had redeeming qualities. He, yeah. would, okay. he would, every one of his uh, colleagues, 
He would steal stories from us, me too. Um, there, was, there was never a moment, ever, that someone on the show was not talking to Mike Wallace. But everybody forgave him. He had a, I don't want to say kind side, but he, he was a mensch and a brilliant journalist. Um, and I personally liked him very much. Um, Loved him. We're, as Ted Koppel used to say, we're almost at the end of our time, and we're not going to run over like he let made affiliates do at Nightline. He used to drive people crazy. He would say, I'm telling our affiliates we're going over five minutes, and they would, you know, all of that. <laughs> We've got this program to put on at 12. At CBS, they just pull the plug. You'd be talking and would go to commercial. Um, actually, so there's one question more before the final question. We do. Uh oh, I, you've been saving. Well, it has to do with the, it has to do with the change in the news business. Now, look, everybody of a certain age thinks things were better in the old days. You know, the tomatoes were better. Uh, there's a line from Atlantic City where Hoodlum says to Burt Lancaster, boy, that ocean, the Atlantic Ocean is great. He said, you should have seen it in the old days. <laughs> I get that. But it does seem to me that, that, that there are changes in the news business that uh, maybe it's generational that are of concern in terms of the commitment to news, in terms of the resources given into news. Yeah. You, you, You've been, at, you've been at your stand for quite a while. What do you see? Well, I'm like you, and I, I always question whether it is because I'm older. Uh, but I feel deeply that because of technology, I blame technology for all of this, that we've lost, one, the time to think. Because of technology, an event happens, and the correspondent or reporter has to say something instantly. There's no time to make a phone call. There's no time to get another opinion. That's just one problem. The other problem is that because there are so many outlets now and so much competition for each news division, that the audience for each one is getting smaller and smaller. That means revenue is lost. And it's an expensive business that we're in, particularly television news is expensive especially if you get to travel the way we do. And so when I say I despair, I despair for broadcast news in general. And, and not just because of the fear that the quality will be so diluted and diminished, just because no, no one outlet will be able to afford us. And you are so lucky, and in my career I was so lucky, because when I would go out for Nightline, um, first of all, they give you time to do the piece, and, and, you know. Yeah. So you're going to travel for a couple of days. You're going to interview. Then you're going to come back and think about it. And if you need seven or eight minutes, which in television terms is pretty generous for a piece, not two, you'll take that. There's a story that Katie Turr tells in her first book where she's um, flying out one of the candidates. Maybe it's Trump. Mm -hmm. And she gets a call from the desk saying, um, you got to go live in four minutes. And Katie says, to say what? I mean, I literally just got here. Well, you gotta, you're on the air. Huh? I'm sure that's And, wow. you know, obviously 60 Minutes does not have that problem at all. Right. And but that's pretty, I'm sure that's not an unusual story. Well, you're lucky, CBS people are lucky because you don't have a cable network. Seriously, <laughs> right? Right, we don't. Well, but we're, we do have streaming services. Yeah, now. okay. We do. But this, the idea that, that you hit the ground and you're on the air with no time to research and no time to check facts and no time to think. Yeah. So what you get is, you know, a kind of superficial thing. So who remembers Eric Severide? Oh, you all remember. So Eric was once asked to write a second commentary for some other outlet. So he was doing the evening news with Walter Cronkite. And then he was asked to write a second commentary and he said, no, nope, no. Nope. I only think once a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these poor people are out there putting things on the air constantly. How many times do they have to go out and do live shots is what they're called. Well, we haven't even talked about the, the more amusing aspect of cable news, which is how they cover things like the Trump indictment. Mm. And now the motorcade is moving down <laughs> 16th Street <laughs> and Harrison Avenue. That Avenue Harrison named, of course, after Benjamin Harrison, the 17th president of the United States. Now the car is turning right. It is in 2012. I believe that would be a Lexus. Yes, a Lexus, a hybrid. 
<laughs> and you just want to stand up. You just want to say, for God's sakes, no, do this. <laughs> Shut up. You know. So, oh, and now we're at the courtroom. Tell us for the 15th. Well, he'll walk through these doors. You'll notice there's windows on the doors. Then he'll open the door, and then he'll turn to the right. <laughs> and, I, and what did you notice from the three seconds? Well, he looked really worried to me. You know, <laughs> that's the part of the business that I laugh so I do not weep. You make me feel so lucky. I know I am. <laughs> so I ask all everybody at this forum the same question. You may have answered it. Optimist or pessimist about where we're headed? It sounds like you... Pretty dark. After us, the deluge, huh? Yeah. I'm, Look, I'm worried. But I think everybody in this room is worried. Okay. Just to be clear about this, this, you know, given the circumstances of the last week, this is something that Leslie Stoll did not have to do. Um, she did it. She answered these questions. Taylor, after this, we're going out to drink. And... <laughs> and I think all of us, not just for tonight, but for the last several decades, owe you a debt of gratitude for Leslie Stoll.